I want to read a story that it's a true story, in fact, uh, that drives home what we're going to be talking about today. What I've kind of said is this missing ingredient that we're going to look at today. There is a, a missionary who was serving as a medic in a small village in Africa. Who periodically, he had to travel by bicycle through the jungle to a nearby city for supplies. I, I might have shared this with you before, uh, but anyway, uh, this trip would take him at least two days, so he would uh, camp out in the jungle overnight. He'd made the trip several times without incident, but one day he arrived at his destination and saw two men, two men that were fighting. One of them was seriously hurt, so he treated the man, shared Christ with him, and then went on about his business. Well, upon arriving in the city several weeks later, he was approached by this man that he had treated earlier, and the man said to this missionary, I know you carry money and medicine. Some friends and I had followed you into the jungle that night after you treated me, knowing that you would have to sleep overnight in the jungle alone. We waited for you to go to sleep, and we planned to kill you and take the money and the drugs. But as soon as we started to move into the campsite, we saw that you were surrounded by 26 armed guards. There were only six of us, so we knew we couldn't possibly get near you, so we left. Well, hearing this, the missionary laughed at him and said, well, that's impossible. I mean, I assure you, I was alone in that campsite. And the young man strongly disagreed and said, no, sir, I don't think you understand. I wasn't the only one who saw all these guards. All my friends saw them as well. We, in fact, counted them. There were 26 armed guards, and it was, just, it was because of those guards that we left you alone. And then several months later, he's back in the States. He's giving a presentation, an update to one of the supporting churches in Michigan, and he, shared, he was sharing this experience with this guy in the jungle, and he says, in that moment, a man in the congregation interrupted his presentation, jumped to his feet, and said something that left the church totally stunned. The guy stood up, said, sir, we were with you in spirit, which made the missionary, he was a little confused by what he said, so the man continued, said, on that night in Africa, it was morning here. I stopped by the church to gather some material for an out-of-town trip uh, that we were doing at the church, but as I was putting my bags in the trunk, I felt the Lord leading me to pray for you. It was an extremely strong prompting, so I got on the phone, gathered some men from the church, and we gathered together to pray. And then the man turned around and said, will all of the men who prayed with me please stand up? And every single one, all 26 of them stood. See, for some of you, that might sound weird. That might sound, oh, I'm not sure I really believe that, even though it's a true story. I'm not so sure I can buy into that. But my question is, what if that wasn't weird? What, what, what if that was actually expected? And my question for you this morning is, do you realize that that same power is available to you? And if you actually believed it, would you actually want it? If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up with me to Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, as we're continuing in this series called The Invisible War, we are about five weeks into it. Not about, we are five weeks into this series. Uh, if you've missed any of them, or if, this is, if you're a guest, I just want you to know my name is Bob, and it is great to have you here at Sci Life. We hope that you'll come back. Thanks for, tu for tuning in if you're online. And uh, if you have questions, if this is kind of, you know, you're not so sure about this whole invisible war, spiritual warfare do yourself a favor, please go back and get caught up to speed. Uh, you can watch those messages online and you can find out what we're talking about. But I'm, instead of uh, trying to recap where we've been for the last five weeks, you can go back and listen. I'm gonna start Ephesians chapter six. Let's drop to verse 10. We have a lot of room to cover this morning. It says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So over the last five weeks, we've covered in depth these verses. So what we've realized is that we are in a very real invisible war. 
And we've also realized that this war is not against flesh and blood, but we often think it is. I, I think my war, when you are in conflict with me, is you. I think the war is on, with the person that says something negative on, on Facebook. I think the war is the person that, you know, is say, sending that horrible text. I think the war, like we often think it is flesh and blood, but Paul is saying, no, it's not. It's against the principalities and the powers of darkness. So he says, stand firm and get battle ready. And the way that you get battle ready is by putting on this armor. And so we look at every single piece. We looked at the belt of truth. We looked at the breastplate of righteousness. We looked at the shoes that were called to put on for the, for the gospel of peace. We're, we looked at the, you know, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit. And we looked at how each one is significant to fighting in this battle. And then without almost missing a breath, he goes to verse 18. And he says, praying, well, when? Well, he says, at all times. You say, well, how? He says, in the spirit, with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, which we're gonna come back to that, with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, which means believers. And also for me, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. So listen to me. I firmly believe that the missing ingredient that, that is missing in most Christian lives and in most churches is intercessory prayer. It is spirit-driven prayer prayer. You say, well, well, you know, what kind of prayer is that? It's, it's the prayer that, that really restores relationship. It's the, it's the kind of praying that brings healing into people's lives. It's the kind of prayer that, that breaks down walls. It's the kind of prayer that when it's in combination with the armor of God, it transforms lives. This is the kind of prayer that Paul's talking about. And my question to you is, do you want to pray like that? Do you want to see your life and your loved one's lives transformed? Do you want to see your community being impacted for the name of Jesus? Do you want to see the place that you work begin to, to start leaving the place of darkness and beginning to recognize and acknowledge Jesus for who he is? Like, this is what prayer does when we actually choose to put it into practice like Paul talks about. And so if, if we want to learn how to pray, Paul says, with all prayer and supplication or petitioning, he says, pray at all times. And then he tells you, you say, but how do we do this? And he says, in the spirit, you're like, well, that doesn't help me. Like, what does that even mean? And it means like that your, your prayers are going to be directed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're like, that doesn't even make sense. Like, what in the world does this mean? And, and again, you're trying, to, you're trying to figure out, like, how do we pray in the spirit, okay? How, like, what does this look like? Now, I want you to write this down. Here it is. I don't know. I don't I mean, think about this. Like, how, how does the sovereignty of God, like God is sovereign over all, and how does the free will of man, because he gives us the freedom to choose, we're not robots, and then this, this invisible world that we can't see that is going on, like, how does the sovereignty of God, the free will of man, and the invisible world all intertwine? I have no idea. I wish I, could, I wish I was smart enough to be able to express, or excuse me, to explain all of it to you in such clarity. The reality is, it's a mystery. If you could understand and explain all of it, you'd probably be God. And thank God you're not, right? Like, like that is not who, like, we can't comprehend an infinite God with a finite mind. Like, we just, we just can't. And so as we're trying to figure this out, here's where some of you go, well, man, I, I don't know about, you know, is it really, does it happen, is it real, I don't know. And so then you just don't pray. But the reality is the scriptures command us to pray. Like we are called to pray, and the fact that it is a mystery shouldn't keep us from praying or being able to seek the Lord or to bang on the doors of heaven. Like we are commanded 
to pray. And so he calls us to pray. And the way that us as believers, as followers of Jesus, are called to withstand the attacks of the enemy, he says, put on the armor and I want you to put, you know, grab the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he says, I want you to pray. And not only do we withstand the attacks and the the schemes of the enemy, but this is where we also take kingdom ground. You're not called to be on your heels. You're not called to just, just withstand and, and take it all. You're called to also fight. Like you're called to battle against these principalities. And so the way that happens is not only when we put on the armor and pick up the sword, the word of God, but when we have this, what I would call consistent and intense and strategic prayer. Because when we have the scriptures and prayer, I'm just telling you, it is the most powerful weapon that we've been given as believers. Now, I want, you to, I want you to think about this. What I have seen over the last 30 plus years in numerous churches, I'm not just the churches I've worked at, but I've, I've had the privilege of speaking in lots of churches and consulting with lots of churches and coaching a number of pastors at different churches. And, and here's what I've seen. I have seen over and over and over again churches that are full of people that do not read their Bibles and rarely ever pray. And yet it is the most powerful weapons that we have. And yet we choose to not even be in the word. We choose to barely even pray. And and again, it's the most powerful weapons that God has given us to fight back against the enemy. And it's right there for us to utilize for our families, for our marriages, for our churches, for our leaders, for our country. And we would rather spend more time making bold, at times ridiculous statements on the internet instead of taking it to the Lord in prayer. Remember, remember, remember when the disciples, they were attempting, it's in Mark 9, they were attempting to try to uh, cast out a demon and it wasn't working? And they come to Jesus, they're like, what's going on? Like, why can't we seem to do this? And, and Jesus' response is, this kind uh, of demon cannot be driven out except for with prayer. Like, there's just something powerful. If one of your friends is under attack, like, you're called to go pray for them or pray over them or with them. We see this with Jesus, with Peter in Luke chapter 22. He says, Jesus is saying, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I, this is, this is Jesus speaking, have, and what's it say? But I have what? But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Like, think about this. If prayer is so essential to withstanding spiritual attack, why do we pray so rarely? If Jesus, the Son of God, modeled and recognized prayer is so critical for him to overcome temptation and attack, Why would it not be so critical for us? And when we we wonder or we struggle with the traps and the temptations of this world, and you're wondering like, man, why can't I just get him to overcome this? Why do I keep struggling? Why do I keep falling back into these, all these kind of things? Here's my question. Here's my question for you. Tell me about your prayer life. You will see a correlation, I promise you. Because when you are struggling, just like when I was struggling, I, 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 I could tell you so many different times, like when I was in habitual sin, the last thing I wanted to do was spend time with God. Even though I, I knew the word, even though I, I knew prayer was readily available, even though like when I was in a miserable sp- you know, state, I would be like, dear God, please get me out of this. I promise I'll never go back, right? Like it's always those kind of things and you just go right back in oftentimes to whatever it is that's got its claws on you. And, and, and again, it's in those moments that the Lord's saying, hey, we have access to the very throne room of God and we're called to pray. Think about it. Like what? When you, if you were just to do a study on the New Testament and what characterized the church, you know what it was? <laughs> Prayer. Think about it. Acts 1. Jesus has gone 
to be with the Father. The, the disciples and the, and the believers, they're, are, they're all kind of huddled up. They're afraid they're probably going to get arrested and be killed because they followed that, that guy, Jesus. And, and so they're just waiting because Jesus told them to wait. So they're just waiting anxiously. And, and, and what are they doing? They're praying. Acts 2, because the Holy Spirit came and Pentecost happens and, 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 and all of a sudden, uh, you know, prayer, they just, they just start breaking out and then prayer characterizes the whole church. Acts 3, they're, you know, Peter and John right before, uh, you know, they're, they're heading to a prayer meeting at the temple right before the very first, what they would call the miracle of the church, which is Peter and John, uh, when, they, when they healed the guy right outside the temple. Acts 4, they're, they're standing in front of the spiritual leaders and, and again, they're being perfect persecuted and, 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 you know, told to, hey, you can no longer talk about this dead guy, Jesus. And, and then they go back after they're, you know, pretty much, you know, persecuted by them. And they, they go back to the believers and, and they start praying. And if you go back and actually read, read what they're praying, they're not praying, oh, please, God, keep us from, you know, from any more torture. No, no, no. They're, they're praising God and praying that God would give them the boldness to continue to speak his name in their community. That's what they're praying. And then when you get to Acts 6, you know, that you, you've seen all this persecution going on and, and, and the apostles realize like, hey, there are all these needs of the church and there's no way that we can meet all these needs. In fact, we need to raise up some other people to meet these needs because we can't stop spending time teaching the word of God and prayer. Like as you keep reading, you're gonna see prayer was a critical component that characterized the New Testament church. And here's a question I get asked all the time. So Bob, why don't we see the same kind of powerful things that happened in the Bible? Why don't we see those things today? And oftentimes my response is because their prayers, they weren't rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, thanks God, and then you eat. They weren't mealtime prayers. They weren't these you know, bedtime prayers, God, help us sleep well tonight, good night, amen, like, you know, give us a good rest, help us not have any bad dreams, get us up in the morning, like, they weren't these bedtime prayers, there weren't these, God, please help us find a good deal on Amazon after we put the kids to bed, it wasn't those kind of prayers, like, these were prayers that they were intimately, not only connecting with the Lord, but they were prayers because they knew they were in an intense battle. And in order to fight an intense battle that is a war that is waging around them, they were going to need the most powerful weapon that God had given them, and it's this intercessory, spirit-driven prayer. It's the thing that fights against the enemy's schemes. So the Apostle Paul, in verses 18 through 20, kind of gives us these three characteristics of the kind of prayers that if you wanna learn how to pray, and it's not some magical click your heels, say certain words, it's, it's, it's not that at all, because if that's what you're looking for, this is, you're not gonna get that here. But this is spirit-driven prayer that gets supernatural results and will deliver you out of this warfare. The first one is consistent prayer. We're called to pray. one prayer. You don't just keep praying the Lord's prayer over and over and over and over and over again and think like that. Like it's, it's all these different prayers, all kinds of prayers. He says, and supplication, which means a very specific request. In fact, in 1 Timothy 2 verse 1, listen to this. He says, first off, then I urge you, same author, that, 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 that supplications, prayers, it's an S there, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all People, the, he's trying to help us understand there are all different kinds of prayer. And what Paul is getting at, he's saying, listen, you need to stay consistent in, in your prayers. Like you need to continue to go to the Father on, uh, you know, through Jesus on, uh, you know, whether it's you, your family, others' behalf. 
Now, what I want to do is I want to give you an acronym. I've taught this before. You might know uh, this acronym. It's A-C-T-S. You think of Acts, if you want to think of Acts of the Apostles, whichever. Uh, But it's A-C-T-S. It's an acronym that might just kind of help you think through, like, guiding your, your prayers, okay? The A is for adoration. So when you start off to pray... You just want to spend time appreciating God, adoring God for who he is, not necessarily for what he's done. We'll get to that later. Just spend time appreciating and adoring God for who he is. Listen to me. It is easy. If you were to come up to me and say, hey, Bob, you guys have been married for over 30 years. What is it that you adore about Sue? I could list numerous things. Has nothing to do with what she's done for me, what she's done for our family, what she's done for this church, what I see her do for so many other people. Has nothing, like all those things I greatly appreciate about her, but what I adore about her is a lot of things about who she is as a person. I know her so well. Now, if you struggle to say, man, I don't even know what I would say, or it might be like two words. Like, I'm just telling you, you don't know God very well. And so don't feel bad about that. Just have it motivate you to get in the word so you can learn to say, God, I just am so grateful because I want to learn more about who you are as, as a faithful God, as a trustworthy God. God, you're gracious and you're merciful and you're kind and you're generous. God, I know that you're also, like you judge sin, and you're righteous. And Lord, there's just so many things that I want to learn and just start learning about them so that when you start in prayer, you just start off with, Not you. You start from a posture of God, I just want to wake up and I just want to just just adore who you are. The second thing is confession. Just spend some time confessing your sin. And I I say this all the time, but he already knows. Like, he's not going to be shocked. He's not going to be like, oh, can't believe that. They're struggling with this. Just go ahead and tell him. Like, get it out, like, just articulate it, confess it to them. If you need to go to somebody else, confess it to them. If you're, if you're not sure and you feel like, oh, I don't feel like I really have anything, first off, that's great. If you don't, but ask the Lord, like, this is a great, powerful prayer. Be careful, because he's going to tell you. But if you actually pray, like, God, if, if there's anything, like, rooted in my heart, if there's anything that I haven't confessed, if, if there's anything, if there's a blind spot, if there's something I'm just not seeing or acknowledging, uh, would you please bring it to my attention? Like, pray that. And then when he does, then take full responsibility for it. Like, own it. Like, say, God, you're right. Like, I need to to confess that. It could be when you're driving in traffic and you say something or you think something or you do something or whatever it is. It could be at work and somebody says something or or it could be something that you're seeing and you find yourself coveting and you have, you've just kind of blown it off or or you made a decision and, and you just call it a mistake and God's like, that wasn't just a mistake. Like, that was sin. Like, you need to call it for what it is. You need to repent of it and you need to own it and you need to ask for forgiveness for it. Like, we need to learn what it means to confess our sins and, like, ask the Lord to forgive us of those sins. And if it's with somebody else, you, you go to them. But that's that confession part. The T is for thanksgiving. Like, this is the part where you just thank God. Like, God, thank you. Thank you for blessing me with, you know, my wife, Lord, thank you for blessing me with this family. My grandkids, like, Lord, thank you for your provision. Thank you for your protection. Lord, thank you for opening this opportunity. Lord, thank you for this friendship. Lord, thank you. Like, like Lord, just thank you for all that you are doing and, doing. and be specific. Like, get specific on all the things you're thankful for. It's amazing the amount of times people say, I've been praying for this thing, and I finally got it. Like, I, it finally happened. I'm like, that's awesome. Did you thank God for it? And they're like, oh, I never even thought about that. Like, we want God to answer, and then he answers. Like, do we ever go back and just thank him? And it's amazing that when we spend a lot of time having an attitude of what I call an attitude of gratitude, it's amazing how often that changes my perspective. And then the last thing is supplication, which is kind of a big word for ask. Like, it's just, these are where you bring specific requests to your Heavenly Father. In James 4, 2, uh, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. This is often where we start, unfortunately. 
But take all your requests. It's okay. Take it to them. It could be about your marriage. It could be about your kids. It could be about your parents. It could be about school, college, job, future. You know, it, it, it could be about money. It could be about your house. It could be about conflict. It could be about whatever it is. He says, bring all of that stuff to him because he wants this relationship with you. But if you notice, the area that we spend the most time oftentimes in our prayer is what's actually last in this acronym. Now, th think about it. If, if you were, if, if your kids, if all they ever did was come to you and ask for money and for a ride to something because they didn't have their, you know, a vehicle or they didn't have their license, it would probably make you feel like, is all you, is all you think I'm supposed to do, I'm, I, I'm just an ATM machine to you, Right? Like, I'm just an Uber service. Is that all you think that I am? Like, it, it would feel that way if that's all they ever really come to us. But what would happen if your kids, think about this. I really want you to think about this. What would happen if all of a sudden your kids started coming to you and say, you know, mom, dad, whatever it is, like, uh, I, I just want to know about you. Like, I'd just love to know your story. Like, what was it like growing up? What, what was it like when you, were, when you were in school and, like, there was no such things as the internet and the computer? Like, what was it like being so old, like, way back, like, way back then when you learned how to, on a literal typewriter? Like, you know, what was it like not to have cell phones? Like, tell me your story. How did you, how did you get to where you are? How did you, in, you know, you know did you, you, the environment, like, just, I, I just want to know. Like, I'm so curious to know about you. Or, or and, and then maybe if your kids started expressing, like, hey, you know, I, I just know that you, know, you said something the other day and the way I handled that I think probably hurt your feelings but based upon you know, the way that you responded. Will you please forgive me? Like, is there anything else that I've done or said? Like, is there anything that you feel like I've, I've, I've said that maybe I'm not seeing and that you wanna bring? Because I just wanna take full ownership of that. Will you please forgive me for that? And then what if, then they said, hey, I just, I've been noticing all these things for whatever reason, I haven't really told you, but I'm just so thankful because I know you make so many sacrifices and you guys spend so much money to provide and give me opportunities that maybe you never had as a kid. And I just, I'm just so, thankful for all this stuff. God, would you just, would you, you know, I just want you to know I'm, I'm incredibly thankful for all that. What happens if your kids did all of that stuff? You would probably be, you, some of you are laughing, you're like, Psh, like that would never happen. Like my kids, all they think about themselves, right? And I just wonder in those moments, does God feel the same way with us? Like it's so easy to see the immaturity in somebody else, like a child. And I just wonder, as God's children, does he see or are we off, does he feel like that way with us? Because our prayers are often centered, God, give me this. I need this. I want this. And then we get ticked when he doesn't give us what, he want, what we want. See, he's called us to be consistently praying and to seek him and to know him. I see in Psalm 55 where David says, in the morning and at noon and in the evening, I pray and God hears me. We're called to pray at all times. There's times when I'm just driving and I feel like the Holy Spirit prompts me or puts a name on my heart of, of somebody or, 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 or face, you know, maybe because I can't remember their name, but I can remember a face and, and, and whatever it is, and I don't even know what's going on. I'm just gonna start praying. Like, that is spirit-directed prayer where the Lord brings stuff or, or I feel like he's starting to speak to me. And, and, and again, I'm like, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? Is it something with the church? Is it something with me? Is it something with our family? Is it, is it something with, you know, a, a, you know, other greater span? Is like, like, what is it that that you want to say. I want all distractions put aside. I want any and everything turned off. Like, God, what is it that you want to say? Like, he's called us to pray at all times. This consistent prayer. The second one is intense prayer. Intense prayer. Again, verse 18, he says, keep alert with all perseverance. This word alert means to be vigilant. It means to pay attention. This is, this is 
This is not the type of praying where you have a list and you're saying, and, uh, and God, pray for Aunt Sandy, and then when I get to the uh, second service, God, help there not be so many parking uh, lines, and, 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 and Lord, would you also uh, help me get good deals at the mall? Like, this is, this is not those kind of prayers. Th- th- those prayers are fine. The prayers that, this is, that he's talking about with this intensity of prayer is when you're lasered in. Like when you're dialed in, where you're focused in, and it's intense. Like, like you realize you are in a battle because he says it's with all perseverance. It's when you endure, where you don't give up, where, where people's lives, their marriages, your, their, their, their future is on the line. And because there are going to be times when it feels hopeless. And you've been praying for quite a long time and you're just not sure if it's ever going to happen. You're not sure if it's ever going to change. I mean, think about it. What if you were to have known Saul, who eventually became Paul, as a teenager, and you're sitting there, and you're just like, you would have never have thought God would ever do what he absolutely has done through the Apostle Paul. And look what he did. We never know what's in front of us or what's in our future, but if we were to consistently pray, I remember praying with a dear friend of mine for his parents for over 15 years. For his parents to come to know Jesus, and eventually they finally did. Like, we just would not give up. And he even said, Man, he goes, I don't think it's ever gonna happen. I said, Well, it's not up to us to figure that out, it's up to us to pray. Like, let's just pray. I think of my dad. You know, if some of you know my story where my parents divorced, I got to see my father probably once a year, maybe twice a year. He'd come for one of my games a year. and I'd see him a little bit during the summer. Went off to college to play basketball, and and, uh, and the coach that recruited me less, it was miserable, and I wasn't living for the Lord. I had really drifted away from, like, I I was, I I loved the, I loved Jesus. I just couldn't stand going to church. And and so I I remember just, I knew what I was doing was wrong. I knew I was in sin. Uh, I, I got into a lot of trouble. Uh, my senior year, anyway, went off to college, and and I was miserable. My my dad, you know, I called my dad. I was like, "Hey, can you pick me up?" Because I, you know, I know I don't want to stay here. And and uh, he took me to a Bible college. I'm like, "This is the last place I ever wanted to be." Was a Bible college because the last thing I wanted to ever do was like be a pastor. And so so anyway, I say all that to say he he drops me off, and in that short window of, of a week that I I met up with this with this team, and, and God got a hold of my heart in a miraculous way, and, and I remember coming back, and I called my father. And I said, Dad, I just, I just want you to know, I've recommitted my life to Christ, and I, I'm gonna choose to follow him. And for the first time in my life, ever, My dad is weeping on the other end of the phone. I'm like, Dad, are you okay? Like, what's, he's like, Robert, he said, I've been waiting for a phone call, and my fear was it was going to be one of two calls. One, it was either going to be that you were dead because of how you were living, or you were going to finally turn back to God. And I have been praying for you every day. And I'm telling you, parents, do not give up praying for your kids. Don't give up praying for your marriage. Don't give up. You need this kind of intense prayer where there is a battle for your children's lives and for, the, for, for your relationship with your spouse. Like there is a battle war that is going on, and we need to learn how to pray intensely with all perseverance. The third and and last one that he talks about is strategic prayer. So those are my words. In verses 19 and 20, he says, he's, he's talking about prayer, and he says, and also pray for me, that the words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly. Listen, 
We need to ask others for prayer. If you're not asking people to pray for you, there's some pride that's going on, and I don't know what it is, but it is a huge need. Like people, it's been so sweet of many of you where you've emailed me and, and just say, hey, I just want you to know, uh, you know, we're praying for you, our small group's praying for you. That just means the absolute world to me, so thank you. It's so important to me. Uh, he says that the words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. speak. See, Paul is saying, I, I, you need to stand firm and, and you need to put on the armor and then, God, as I speak, give me the boldness to say what you need me to say. Like, would you help me declare, not shrink back out of fear, not, not, not be reserved because I don't want to offend anybody, but God, would you give me the boldness to speak your good news and share it with others? See, I often think we pray too small. We just pray too small. We often just pray, like, God, you know, would you help my family? God, would you help me as I go to work today? Put a hedge of protection in me as I drive. God, would you please bring us more finances? And again, all of those things are fine. God says, bring all of that stuff to him. But that shouldn't be the only thing you're praying about. This is what Paul's getting at. Because the reality of most of our prayers is, dear God, please help my life be as, as comfortable as it can possibly be. I don't want to have to deal with difficulties. I don't want to have to deal with anything that's hard. And then when God doesn't answer that prayer and things are hard and you're going through difficulties, you get upset and angry with God. And I just wonder if we were sitting down having a cup of coffee with Paul, I think Paul would say, why in the world would you think this is all about you? Like, this is about God and accomplishing his plans. And as you have breath, he's called you to be a disciple maker of Jesus. And it's going to cost you your life. And so be prayed up because the attacks are coming. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great when there can be some level of comfort in our lives. Those are always wonderful and stuff. But he called us to pray with boldness. Like when Acts 4, when, when they're being persecuted and they're, they're, they're just, they're, you know, they're, they're taking it for, for being this follower of Jesus and their responses, and this is what I hope that we can get to, is where we can say, hey, you can arrest me, you can even kill me, but I'm not going to stop talking about what I've seen and I've heard. Like I'm going to declare the boldness of Jesus to whoever well, listen, and again, what happens if we start praying strategic things like big prayers like, God, that you, you would give us favor, not only in this community, but you would give us favor around the world. Like, would you help us equip the people that live from other countries as they go back to see their families? Like, like God, would you take the good news through them to make an impact in their, in their culture and communities as they go back home? Like, God, would you give us, would you open doors in the schools? God, would you give us favor with administration? Lord, would you do, like, all of a sudden, we start praying these big strategic prayers like God would you unify your church in this country for heaven's sakes Lord would you do that work God would you give the leaders leadership and would you empower them with hope and courage and boldness and a desire to care well for people and to serve and to lead them well see there's a big difference hear me on this there is a Big difference in saying, Lord, please help me find a close parking spot. Lord, please help my team beat the Washington Commanders today. Like, there's a big difference in praying that prayer versus saying, God, as I go out to my work, as I go out to my job, as I go out into my neighborhood, as I go out to the golf, like, God, would you help me see people the way you see people? And would you give me the boldness to speak and give an answer with gentleness and respect? Like, God, would you go before me? And Lord, as the enemy is attacking, as the enemy wants to throw these arrows, as the enemy wants to throw those darts, would you help me not take it personally? But Lord, would you help me be able through prayer and through putting the armor on, would you help me see it? It's from the principalities of darkness. And listen to me, parents. Listen, this is such a burden on my heart. When you start realizing, when you start realizing the enemy wants your kids' souls. This ain't a game. 
And like the invisible enemy that we are facing is in charge of demonic forces and literally sends out agents from the headquarters of hell. And we just send our kids off, get up, you know, get up, get some food, all right, get your clothes on, all right, head out. As if there's nothing going on. What happens if we all of a sudden started seeing our, we're sending our kids out into this culture and we need to prepare them, we need to pray over them, we need to surround them with prayer and gird them up for what they're going through because that is a responsibility for us as believers. Listen to me, I've got to, daggone, I've got to stop, so sorry. Um, I was just going to start too. No, just kidding. <laughs> Uh, listen, we're, we're gonna have some prayer warriors that are gonna come forward. I'm gonna invite you to prayer, but here's some things that you can be praying about, and here's some things as you even come forward to pray with people. Pray for your marriage, pray for your family, bring your whole family down for heaven's sakes. Like, like surround them with prayer, whatever it is. We wanna be praying uh, for, our cult, for our community, for our country, uh, that we would actually have unity and, and, and not continue divisiveness, Lord, that we would also be battling uh, for what's happening uh, in our church and what's happening in other churches that God would, would open those doors, would have us give, have the boldness to share the good news with others that we wouldn't shrink back, that we wouldn't be afraid. And here's something really specific, specific that you can be praying for. Be praying that Harris County would finally accept and move forward with our, uh, you know, all the things that we need to do to build. We've been waiting for this for two years. It has been a ridiculous, very frustrating very frustrating battle. We started a capital campaign that some of you have been giving to, and we haven't been giving updates because we keep having the same conversations over and over and over for two years. And I have to trust that God is sovereign. He oversees. If you want to change it, he can. So I'm asking, would you please join us in praying for that so that we can move forward? Because we need to build. We need to keep growing. God is doing something, and we want to continue to be a part of what he's doing. So pray with us. Hey, I'm going to pray. I'm going to invite you to come down, ask these people to pray for you, and, uh, and we, I hope that you have a wonderful day. Jesus, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for this gift of prayer. God, that we would be stewards of prayer that we would learn how to pray continuously. We would pray, learn how to pray intensely. We would pray strategically, Lord, that we would see your spirit work and move. And so as, we're, that as we hear stories of what happened in Africa with this missionary, like that would just become commonplace. Like we would see people constantly being healed, that we would see marriages reconciled and restored. We'd see people giving their lives over to Jesus. We would see just you work and move, God. We want your spirit to move, and we just wanna be participants as much as you're willing to allow. And God, would we stand firm for our kids and for these relationships and marriages and families? God, would you help us stand firm and not be on our heels? And that we would take kingdom ground for your name and for your sake and for your glory. God, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys have a good day.